Today, we're going to be taking a look at the new Sony HTST5, which is available, I believe, now for pre order. And we're going to look a little bit behind the scenes at some of the different features that are available on it beyond the unboxing that I did a couple of days ago. Uh, one of the things I'll mention right off the bat is that um, I have a traditional 5.1 system and I've actually never listened to a soundbar before and so I was very interested in seeing exactly how the um, simulated surround would uh, stand up against a traditional surround sound system. So we'll uh, get to that a little bit later on in the review. First, let's look at the design and build. When I took the soundbar out of the packaging, I was impressed at the weight of it and not only that, but the extremely high-end finish. It's made out of aluminum and it has a nice uh, metal grill in the front to cover the uh, driver array. And uh, when you look at it, it looks like a very high-end item. Uh, on the edges, they've gone ahead and they put angles on those so that it looks uh, very modern. And uh, it doesn't have an output to the, uh, your monitor display to tell you what the different statuses are, the inputs you have selected. So that's accomplished by uh, an LED panel behind the array that actually gives you the status of the various different inputs and the soundbar itself. Now the subwoofer is another story in my mind um, because it looks uh, very much like the subwoofers that uh, if anybody was around in the 90s uh, when subwoofers became very popular as part of like uh, multimedia systems on uh, computers, uh, they all kind of have that same basic square look with the synthetic finish and unfortunately I feel like the subwoofer looks very similar to that. Um, it has a cloth grill in the front and in fact it stands pretty high off the ground um, it's about a foot and a half. So from my point of view, I actually think the subwoofer would look better uh, if it was actually placed on its side. Um, it would have less of a footprint, I think, in your, uh, your living area, in your theater. Um, but unfortunately, what Sony's done is they've actually um, already put the uh, feet on the bottom of the subwoofer as well as a, a Sony logo. And so it would be a little bit strange to have it lying on its side because of those things. So I think one of the uh, things that would be good is if Sony actually sent the feet and the logo as separate self-adhesive items. So you could decide what kind of orientation you wanted for the subwoofer and then you could add those things later on. Next, let's move on to actual setup. Now, if you're like me and you have your traditional 5.1 system, you've probably gone through the situation where you had to go through and pry up your carpet to run the cables underneath to run to your, either your rear speaker or to your subwoofer. And we all know how fun that is. So I have to say that right off the bat, the setup of the HTSC5 was extremely simple. Basically, once I took the subwoofer and the soundbar out of the box and put them in place, uh, I turned on the sub with a switch in the back and I turned on the soundbar it recognized the sub and I didn't have to do anything else. So from that point of view, the setup of the soundbar is extremely simple. Uh, one of the things that you might notice is that uh, on the back of the subwoofer, there is actually no power indicator. There's no way to see that the, uh, the um, unit is actually on. This is not so bad from a, a long-term point of view because once you have it set up, you really don't need to deal with it anymore. But I think it would be nice to, to have an LED on the back there because it's an instant on switch. It doesn't have a latch to it. So when you press it, you don't necessarily see that it's on. Uh, you have to actually look in the front. And when you're in the front of the unit, you can actually see that little LED uh, to tell you what the status of the subwoofer and whether it's uh, in standby or actually working. Now, of course, uh, some of you are probably wondering exactly what kind of inputs are available on the HTST5. And uh, the nice thing is there are three HDMI inputs that are available and they are all 4K ready. So they're high speed HDMI so you can run 3D or 4K through it. And in addition to that, uh, you can hook up your PS3 or PS4, uh, your Apple TV, anything that has an HDMI output will be able to be fed into the HTST5. Uh, the other thing that um, is available is Bluetooth connectivity. And it also has the near field communication. There's even analog RCA connectors in the back in the event you happen to have an old Walkman lying around. Next, we'll talk about controlling the unit. Now, one of the things I was very happy with was the infrared remote. Uh, and the reason why is because it has kind of this cool new stealth fighter, black diamond faceted uh, surface that Sony has now started to work into its industrial design, which is a bit of a departure from uh, what we typically see with Sony. So it's very attractive and um, it has the main controls that you would need up front, such as uh, input, muting, volume, and things like that. But then uh, you can access within it 
um, the additional sub controls. So if you want to adjust your uh, display, the brightness of the actual LED display, if you want to adjust the subwoofer volume, if you want to adjust uh, some various other uh, functions, you can do that via that built-in uh, sliding door. Now, one of the things that is problematic with this particular design is because of the fact that some of the um, buttons are angled back because of this faceted kind of stealth bomber look that it has, when you're trying to change the controls if you're in a dimly lit environment, like if you're watching a movie, it's difficult to actually see the actual label on the buttons. So Sony would benefit from adding uh, some LED backing to those, some backlighting, to allow people to be able to see what they're actually adjusting. Next, let's talk about the SongPlay app that's available for both iOS and Android. Uh, this uh, application is uh, basically available to control the soundbar, but probably I think for watching movies and, and just day-to-day -day use of it, probably the infrared remote is easier to use uh, just because of the fact that whenever you're connecting to an application to a device, via either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, it always has to constantly go back and, and check in with that device, so a lot of times it's not really ready when you want it to be. Um, what I do think the Song app is good for is for streaming uh, music or uh, other sound to your HTST5. For example, if you're a Spotify fan or if you're a Pandora, you can go ahead and add those to the Song uh, Play app, and then when you're ready to stream, you can just press the button uh, on that particular application and then the application will switch to that user interface. Now that's an important one to remember because you're really not controlling those different applications through SongPlay. It's merely routing your signal, your audio signal from those applications to the HTST5. Where I found it particularly confusing was uh, when using uh, a Sony tablet because the orientation of the tablet is horizontal, but then uh, when I was trying to switch over to Pandora or over to Spotify, the orientation on those applications is vertical. So not only do you have that switch from one app to the other, but then you have the switch from the horizontal to uh, vertical orientation happening back and forth as you switch back and forth between the applications. So this is something that Sony can fix simply if they just set up the orientation for the application to be vertical, then you won't have this kind of weird switching that you see uh, as you're going between apps back and forth between song play. One of the weaknesses I see in the system is the almost lack of connectivity. Besides Bluetooth, there's no Wi-Fi connectivity. There's not even a port to connect, uh, for instance, a USB stick. So it's not a huge issue, but it would be nice if you had some photos to be able to connect it to the sound bar and be able to play those back without having to count on some other device to route it through or through your television. Um, in addition to that, um, I feel like Wi-Fi uh, is a very important thing because we've gotten so used to the fact that we can upgrade our firmware you know, via the internet uh, that that's been a way to continue to get your device to evolve in small ways uh, through, through uh, upgrades to the firmware. So without that, um, I feel like whatever the, the HTST5 is now is what it's going to be into the future, which is not bad, but I do think there's a few little tweaks that would benefit from being able to have firmware upgrades, and I'll talk about those in just a little bit. Uh, one of the other things is I feel that if it did have connectivity, you would truly have an all-in-one system, because right now you've got the 3 day HDMI inputs, you have the Bluetooth, why not add ability to be able to watch Netflix and any of the other streaming services that you enjoy directly in the soundbar? If in fact they decide to build that software in, the system would truly be all in one. So now of course we arrive at the most important part of this review, and that's the sound quality. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I have a typical 5.1 surround sound system with the typical placement of speakers. And so I wanted to see if, in fact, the soundbar would be able to recreate uh, that kind of sound field using just one array and then one subwoofer. The film that I decided to use for the main part of the audition was Star Trek Into Darkness. It's uh, mastered in 7.1, and within the first uh, 10 minutes of the movie, there's plenty of surround sound effects, a stereo panning left to right, there's a wide dynamic range, so it's a perfect uh, type of movie to use to audition the capabilities of the system. 
I configured my standalone Blu-ray player to feed both my reference system and the HTST-5. Uh, I set the settings on the HTST-5 uh, for the standard movie playback and voice. And then once that was all set up, uh, I went ahead and was able to A, B back and forth between both systems to compare them to see how they sounded. I'll say right off the bat that the very detailed highs and the subwoofer's bottom end impressed me immediately. The soundbar in the sub blends seamlessly and the uh, front image is very expansive. It almost feels as if it wraps around the viewer. Interestingly, the subwoofer is an acoustic suspension design, which surprised me. As purists will argue, a seal design, an acoustic suspension design, will give you tighter, more accurate bass, uh, but at the expense of efficiency. But what Sony's been able to accomplish here is not only to create an, a system that will uh, reproduce accurate bass, but at the same time is efficient. There's pr plenty of bass to go around. And this is even more impressive when you think about the fact that it's coming from a single 7-inch driver. In a portion of the reference movie, there's a scene where a, a volcano erupts very loudly. And I was interested in seeing how this subwoofer would be able to handle it. And I have to say that it was able to handle it without any effort at all. It sounded very loud and went very deep into the bass region uh, and was completely convincing to me. During my testing process, I played back a sweep of frequencies to see just exactly how low the subwoofer goes. And I was able to get the subwoofer, even, a, even though it was at a lower volume, to reproduce 30 hertz. So that's, a, that's extremely good for a 7-inch driver and is a testament to the engineers at Sony. During A-B comparisons between my reference system and the soundbar, there are some things I did notice. If you're a purist, you're going to miss the fact that there are sounds that actually come from behind you. Uh, there was a scene in the uh, test movie where there was a set of bird of praise coming through a canyon, and with the 5.1 system you could actually hear the engine start in the back and go to the front speakers. You could hear lasers coming in all the different speakers. And when I switched over to the sound bar, that unfortunately is all now coming from the front. Even despite the fact that the sound field tends to wrap around you, you still miss that realism that you have of those sounds actually coming from the back. One of the other things I think is worth mentioning is since the soundbar is about three feet long, uh, your just plain stereo effects are also a bit diminished because they're only coming from a three, width, a three uh, foot width area. Whereas in a typical surround sound system, you're going to have much more distance than that and you're going to have more pronounced stereo effects. What I see as a more significant issue relates to the system's frequency response. Now, it's an amazing thing with the very simple 10 minute setup, I was able to get the soundbar and the subwoofer to blend seamlessly. And I did a very, very, very simple um, frequency response check of that, and it's extremely flat, which is amazing that they're able to, with just such simple setup, to be able to get the response to be so flat on the system. The downfall, though, is there aren't enough uh, equal, equalization presets available to now tailor the sound to what you typically have in your particular living room. And we know that everyone's living room is different, and so the ability to be able to tweak things to, to raise the bass or the treble or the mid-range to tailor that to your listening preferences is pretty important. But right now, Sony only has uh, one music setting, and this is where it was most apparent. Uh, without the ability to adjust the um, mid-range and the mid-bass, I felt that voices sounded very thin and tinny. Now, because of the fact that when you're watching a movie, you have all that surround sound information up front, I feel like it wasn't as noticeable, although I could see it. But definitely, when listening to music, uh, that lack of presence in the vocals, that lack of bottom end to male vocals especially, I missed. So this is something that could be simply fixed by adding um, the ability to change those equalization settings to something more than just music. Now this is where I again believe there's a problem because without the ability to be able to connect uh, to upgrade the firmware, I think everyone who buys the HTHD5 is going to be stuck with whatever presets are currently there, which is only one right now for music. So in conclusion, I think the HTSD5 accomplished its intended purpose, which is mainly for playback of movies and uh, mostly for playback of streaming content. 
So I think if you are mainly needing your system to do that, it'll work out great. I think it's perfect for apartments, it's perfect for bedrooms or second rooms where you don't want to do the whole cable run and you don't want to uh, deal with the complexity of a traditional 5.1 or 7.1 setup. I think for those of you out there who are purists, you're probably going to miss that surround information that's in the rear. So it may not be something that you're going to rush out and replace the thousands of dollars you spent on your, your home system. So I think the HTSD5 is going to be a perfect system for most everybody. It's ridiculously easy to set up. It sounds good, and at the price point, it's not going to break your bank. So I'd like to thank you for watching the Sony First Look Network, and we look forward to bringing you more reviews and exciting new details for Sony products that are coming up in the near future.